Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration and working in distributed organizations. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 281 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where today we're going to look at what's going on with becoming an international remote worker. <laughs> That's a bit of a, mm -hmm. a, a poor description, but basically we've realized that most of the uh, news and the articles and stories that have caught our eyes in the last month have been about how organizations are starting to deal with people wanting to work remotely from another country and the challenges that that brings, the opportunities that that brings. So... So yes, that's what we are uh, dealing with today or looking at today. And when I say we, my name is Pilar Orti. I'm the director of Virtual Not Distant. And with me for a What's Going On episode, I have, as always, Maya Middlemiss. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hello, everyone. I'm really looking forward to this subject today. Yeah, you're much more of a international digital nomady uh, person than I am. <laughs> well, I'm a bit of a slow mad, really. I've been in the same country for more than a decade, but not always in the same place. So there you go. <laughs> um, so, um, so new listeners, just let, let, let me welcome new listeners. If we uh, we, we pick up some, uh, of course, in the ever, ever evolving world of remote work, new listeners, this is a What's Going On episode where where we review the latest news and we, we give our opinion on them, which we love to do. Uh, but we uh, have a whole website, virtualnotdistant.com, with loads of resources if you haven't checked them out yet. We have a blog, we have all the show notes for the podcasts, which are blog posts on their own, and Maya does those. And also, of course, if you sign up to our monthly newsletter, you can um, download for free a PDF, I think it's 14 pages, which outlines the principles of visible teamwork. So that uh, resource is about leading virtual teams through asynchronous communication and some of the things you might want to look at in your team. If you want to get in touch with me, if you have any questions, pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. But let's start. <laughs> let's start. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think we do need to start with where we are now. So we're recording uh 10th or 11th of August? Uh, 10th, isn't it? 10th. <laughs> 10th <Yeah>. of August. <laughs> Tuesday. Tuesday, 10th of August, 2021. We're in the morning. And um, we've got to start where we're now, which is we're still in the whole returning to the office debate. We're still looking at organizations um, considering hybrid workplaces. And within that, there's all sorts of stuff going on. So... Um, But, but we're hoping that this episode will be a, uh, an evergreen one because we're going to be looking at, again, remote work from uh, in another country. Uh, and it, I think it's very interesting to start with the fact that right now what we're dealing with is um, the fact that employees signed up for a job to be done in certain conditions. Uh, a couple, uh, I'm talking conditions of a couple of years ago and they knew what the conditions mm. are but COVID has shifted all that and I think it's an interesting time that people are trying to renegotiate in a way how they do their work and companies are needing to renegotiate um, and it's interesting because I think that some people might have well chosen a job because of the office location <laughs> where yeah. they were going and that closed or might have changed uh, and some people might never have considered that and now it's the first time they're considering that so I think it's quite interesting this renegotiation in the middle of things yes and it, and the fact that the world is changing around them as restrictions and lockdowns unlock um, often quite unevenly in some cases and people are faced with new possibilities that they haven't had for the last 18 months so it's quite I know this is a very evergreen theme but it's quite a kind of pivotal yes. moment and I think it will be great to revisit this theme as time goes by to see how it evolves because we'll, some of the stuff we'll look at today suggests what some the direction of travel that some people think we're going in but I think there's there's an awful lot that we still don't know how it will unfold. 
Yeah, and what you say makes me think as well that during the pandemic, some people were stuck in other countries and so they had to mm-hmm. be remote workers from another yes. country. Or also, for example, like my husband, whose job really couldn't be done remotely and they had to adapt what he was doing. Yeah. Um, he, for the first time, worked remotely from another country. And I don't think that's something he'd he'd thought of working for an employer. Of course, freelancer, yes. Mm-hmm. And he definitely his organization would have never <laughs> considered yeah. um, uh, allowing someone to to work from abroad. So yes, this has really made um, everyone reconsider stuff. Um, and and just to just just to again just basing this for for now, it's interesting that some organizations are still insisting that people come back to the office. And something that does worry me, and I hope this is not a long term thing, is that they're turning to external motivation. Uh, to ask people to come from uh, to the office. So I wanted to share this article, um, which is called Work at the Office, Win a New Car from cornferry.com. And it was sent to me by Pinara Kaya. And it says, since April, one global real estate firm has been randomly rewarding $10,000 each day to a vaccinated employee who has returned to working in a physical office and expects to continue the practice throughout the summer. Other firms have offered return employees cash, extra days off and chances to win cars or vacations. This is, uh, <laughs> I this this worries me. Oh God, yeah. I don't want to upset Ross, our lovely engineer, by screaming <laughs> too loudly into the mic, but this, that's, um, I'll settle for just a groan instead. This really, I mean, it contextualizes the conversation I'm going to have today that people want something different. If this is honestly what you have to resort to to try and attract people back to the office. But it's also incredibly unfair as well. It reminds me of when um, when my daughters were primary school age, they used to have these prizes and and raffles for full attendance in the year, Mm. um, you know, which really penalised kids with chronic health problems. And it it put the assumption that if you didn't have full attendance, if you were absent at any time, that was basically skiving Mm. rather than something beyond your control. And there are so many reasons people might not want to go back to working in a central office and to kind of lump them all together by saying you won't get this extra perk. I think it's just, it's wrong for so many reasons. And I hope all those people go and work somewhere else. Yeah. And I hope that the, the principles don't stick because if you start to do this Mm. for this, when's the next one that you're going to be trying to change people's habits or, or how, is this how you're going to be influencing people's behavior from now on? Um, This is, this I mean, if it's real estate, maybe it sort of ties into the whole thing of rewarding sales with big prizes and targets Mm, and things, but then you should be rewarding that work. You could close that deal anywhere. (laughs) It shouldn't shouldn't be about being in a building. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so thank you, Pinar. Sorry, Maya. Um, um, but I do want to end with the the last, uh, I think it's the last quote uh, of um, in this article by someone from Corn Ferry saying, there are ways to get people there and remind them why they like, oh, sorry, no, this, no, <laughs> there's a, so, sorry, listeners, sorry, Maya. Actually, no, this is a quote that um, that I hated, which is, these are ways to get people there and remind them why they like working with other people in person. Uh, and is why are you assuming that everyone wants to be around their colleagues rather than other people? Yes, shouldn't we? You know, we now we can choose. We're not in lockdown anymore, yeah. so we can we don't have to be around our family. We can reclaim our social life. Why would you want to go rushing back to the people we work with? Yeah. <laughs> and it could be that they do. You know, there are people who their work colleagues are other main source of support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but not everyone. And we, I mean, no. we talked about this with Chris Slemp ages ago about the fact that this is one of the great things about being able to work away from each other is that you can decide then who you have around you. Um, so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> mm. Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> On the other it. hand, Stop Press, because I only came across this article yesterday, someone who is taking a wholly different approach is Okado in the, the UK. Mm. And Okado, sorry, oh, my trail is not working. There we go. <laughs> uh, Okado is an online supermarket. I think they used to be part of uh, Waitrose, but I think I think they're uh, in- independent now. It's a separate yeah. thing now. Um, yeah. And so they're 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 a high high end uh, online uh, groceries in in the UK. And uh, the th- this kicks us off really well into the main the main themes of the articles. And it, the headline is so. Let me just um, it's Okado Group offers staff remote working abroad, and 
it will have been published at some point on the 9th of August 2021, 18 mm. hours ago. <laughs> and um, and it says staff at Okado Group, the tech firm behind the online grocer, can now work abroad remotely for one month a year. Um, oh, it's only one month a year. Yeah, well, this is because of all the oh, yes, regulatory stuff that we're going to be discussing coming up. But I think it's, you mm. know, it's a great sort of look in the right direction of acknowledging that people want this and you might as well embrace it and support it yeah. and have it out in the open. I mean, it's still complicated yes. because obviously it's not going to apply to everybody at Ocado. An awful lot of their workforce are driving groceries around. Yeah. Um, so they're not going to be able to go and do that from another country. Yeah. So it says the scheme doesn't apply to Ocado Retail, the online supermarket. So it's basically it's the knowledge workers mm. um, for whom working from home has been normal. And just, I'm sure their drivers have been working right through the pandemic anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's a tricky one, but at least they're trying to move in the right direction. Yeah, um, because uh, one of the th um, people says, uh, well, Miss Ainskov, which is, who is the firm's chief people officer, she said that this answered a top question from staff, particularly those who had families abroad and did mm. not want to use up their leave by spending time with them. And I think this is, um, this goes back a little bit to what we were saying earlier, that uh, we don't always want to take time off to be with certain people or to be in a certain environment. And it's really nice if we can continue working but change where we are for whatever reason. Yes, change the context yeah. and it will revitalise the work and the person. And yeah, that's it. really lovely to see that being acknowledged. Yeah. So it's like you say, it is complicated to just say, oh, yeah, you can work from anywhere as we're going to see with some stuff. So uh, it really is um one month a year could be enough uh, for some people. And also it, it sends a very strong message of, look, you can be in another country, we still trust you. Um, a a mm. couple of things from this. So uh, just uh, was talking. So Okado Retail is jointly owned by Okado Group, who are the, the tech part and Marks and Spencer. So they've, they've shifted now just to be a uh, waitress. Mm. Uh, and also it does bring a very, very important question, which we're not going to go into today because it's a huge one. And it's exactly what you were saying, that this does mean that this is a perk for some people in the organization. Mm. So again, this what this is about is about flexibility and again, listening to what people want. And if that works within the company, we can accommodate that doing that. So Again, it's about looking at what other ways can we allow flexibility to people that does not involve location independence. Yes, yeah, but it's it's an encouraging move. And I like the fact that it came out yesterday on the news at the same time as a, a press release, which we're not looking at today, about some government departments trying to force people back to the office or threatening them with changes to their pay and conditions if they want to work from home, which is like the polar opposite of yeah. this. Um, so, you know, it, it proves that for every door closing, there are others opening. Yeah. And on top of that, I again, I don't think I put it in here, um, but I, I did read off um, somewhere also who say, well, if you want to uh, live somewhere where the, again, where the cost of living is much lower, why would you uh, want a salary from another a city? So the, the, the salary mm. adjustment that has been talked about again uh, is... Uh, yeah, that's probably another theme yes, for another podcast. Yes, yes, we yes, need to look yeah. at that, how um, global companies are tackling that, because again, we're seeing a lot of differentiation unfolding, but it does relate to this issue of being able to sort of work from anywhere. Yeah with your existing conditions. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I think that um, all of that. So, uh, so this is starting to be part of the conversation. And I have to say, Maya and listeners, I wasn't expecting to for this to come up in the conversation mm. so soon. Um, I'm surprised and it's good because it does mean that it acknowledges the, the scope and the opportunities of remote work and it's not just working from home. Um, yes. So we've got another article that did the rounds, uh, which actually I think I came across after you shared the other PDF. And this is the Harvard Business Review. And like when happiness hit the agenda some years ago and like when um, remote work hit the front page of the and was the feature, it's always great to see the Harvard Business Review covering this sort of stuff because it means mm. it's hit the mainstream. Yes, it's legitimate now. <laughs> yes, we can talk about it and no one will look at it at us so funny. And uh, this is online. Uh, your company needs a digital nomad policy. 
and it was published mm-hmm. on July the 12th, 2021. And again, it's really what, what it's looking at is um, it, it's a little bit the Ocado um, situation and saying, okay, if your people want to, what do you need to be looking at and, and why? Yes, and you need to think about this and create policy around it. Otherwise, people are just going to go, <laughs> going to do their own thing. And, you know, a lot of places have never had to think about policy around remote work, never mind nomadic work before. It's simply not been part of their corporate culture. And now suddenly they're having to think, well, OK, we can allow this for up to a month under our contract or it has to be within the same country or the same state or um you need to think these things through and consider the regulation and the details of the employment contract you've already got in place, because otherwise people are just going to adopt a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy yeah. and clear off and say, right, I'm not in lockdown now. I'm going to go and live with my mum for a while or something. And you won't even know about mm-hmm. it. And it is really important because you can get into a big mess. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And I, I hang out on quite a lot of digital nomad forums and things like that because of the content work I do for the Estonian e-residency people and there's lots of interesting anecdotes there including some companies that have been catching people out um, with IP audits Mm. I don't know why they're not using VPNs but never mind Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sure they're but even somebody who was saying that they um, they ended up working from the Caribbean through most of lockdown and while everybody else was putting up pictures of Caribbean islands and things as their backgrounds on zoom he he got someone to send him a photo of just a suburban living room (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just to try and look no, but you know companies are going to figure this stuff out and they realize that if people aren't where they think they are then there can be all sorts of legal complications and those complications can affect the employer and the employee in different ways and not positively mm. and so the the reason why the hbr was writing this article i suppose is that and i quote the number and this is u.s numbers the number of digital nomads with traditional jobs rose from 3.2 million in 2019 Mm. to 6.3 million in 2020. That's a 96% increase. So I think that's also the article is saying, we've had digital nomads for ages, but these are mainly, have mainly been freelancers. But actually, digital nomads with traditional jobs, it's a a nice uh, chunky number. Yes, it is. And it, it, you know, it's a growing number as well. We know that people are enjoying that freedom and just starting to realize what it means for them. But it does mean it's going to get complicated. And this has been around for a while. You know, when I first moved to Spain from the UK, I was effectively an employee and had to go to quite complicated lengths to protect the company that employed me in the UK from this concept of permanent establishment, which they talk about in this article, and having a corporate presence in Spain. And, you know, this is none of this is new. And actually, that's because a lot of employment law is a century old anyway. Mm. And it's that, that is the problem at the end of the day is that the regulation is very, very slow to adjust and catch up to what's going on um, in terms of technology and culture and social change. So, yeah, we're going to have to deal with this one. And they've got a really nice piece of advice in this article, which I'm just going to quote directly. Um, they say, draw up an agreement that defines the terms of the agree- arrangement. So draw up an agreement with mm. the person who wants to work remotely from abroad. It should specify that the nomad is a telecommuter whose place of employment is and will remain in a location the company currently operates uh, it yes. operates in. Other terms, such as limiting the amount of time that nomads can spend in any one location and listing No fly zones, as in places that Mm. are off limits because of their compliance rules and regulations, can greatly reduce the risk that the nomad will run afoul of of local legal tax or compliance issues. I I think that's why not. You can restrict. You can say, well, these countries we can manage with you being there, but these countries is going to get too complicated. And I think that's a good conversation to have. Absolutely. And the idea of defining the the normal regular place and saying, okay, you can travel, you know, you can go on trips here and there, but what you mustn't do is become resident there and end up with your own tax residency being compromised and also the concept of a permanent establishment for corporation tax for the employer in that Mm -hmm. place where as long as you define that the place that you're working from is your normal location. And then you put the negative things on like, you, you know, if you go to a country that's like from the US, there are a number of places you can't transfer money, like to pay someone um, if they want to go and, I don't know, 
have a workation in Cuba mm. or Afghanistan or something, then they, you know it might be legal to actually even pay their salary. Mm. So I think to kind of define it as where your normal location is and then say you can travel from there, but using it as a base is your home rather than you become a nomad without any fixed abode or with a different normal location, then hopefully you should be able to work that out. But it, this article does make it clear you want to get that in writing. And then if the person actually doing the work from wherever breaches that, then that's a breach of a policy associated with their contract and then you're into different territory. Mm -hmm. So just being upfront about it um, and transparent. Yeah, and it, it also just gets rid of any assumptions that either part, either party might be making. Yeah. We just These are really things that we need to explicitly talk about. Uh, and by the way, yeah. talking of explicitly, can I explicitly say that we are not lawyers? <laughs> and this <Nope>. is just... <laughs> we're not giving we're advice. We're just uh, saying our opinion on, on this stuff and uh, drawing out some stuff that we think might be of interest to you. So please do not take anything we, um, we say as legal advice. Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely. And a lot of the stuff we're referring to is actually from the US yes. as well. Where So the employment law there is what's being referenced in this article and in the paper that we're going to discuss mm -hmm. next. And basically, it's your own contract of employment that, that rides over everything. Yeah. So start with that. Um, and, uh, and something else that was coming to mind is that this is for um, employees, but also, for example, as self-employed people, as individuals. Uh, I know that I, for example, have to be careful if I wanted to start spending more time in Spain to not be there for mm. more than six months in a run because otherwise yeah. then I become a resident there. So this has been around for ages again, but it's just now like like with remote work, yeah. it's just the scale of it. And like with hybrid work, the scale of it means we have to pay a lot more attention to it. Definitely. I know some people who accidentally wound up a tax resident in Europe and in Spain um, just because of lockdown. Ah, yeah. They ended up exceeding the 180 days. Um, though there was some leeway granted when people literally could not leave But, you know, those exceptional circumstances won't be in place for much longer. And that's really important to point out um, that, that it's been easier to do some of this stuff during the pandemic, but actually start, because everything's going to tighten up soon. So uh -huh. everything we've been, um, some of this that we're talking about was also touched upon in an article from Gallup from the 23rd of June, 2021. I'll just give you the, the title and Maya will stick the link in the show notes. Uh, Top CHROs believe flexibility within a framework is the future of work. So again, this is, everyone's talking about it. Um, now, Maya was referring to a PDF that, that uh, you, you, you brought to, to my attention, <laughs> but that actually is also referred to in the HBR article. So, mm. um, It's from littler.com and oh, I'm trying to, have you got the title there? Because it's. Yes. What to do about global COVID nomads and other wandering workers who telecommute from abroad for personal reasons. It's a, <laughs> a great title. title. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to give us a very, I've got some notes, but do you want to give us a very brief summary of, uh, of what? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, a uh, paper rather yes. than legal advice, I believe. So it's fairly speculative and it's looking at the way people change the way they work and the way people want to change as they become unlocked. And it's an attempt to kind of classify the way people might work remotely and the ways that the legal and regulatory framework might cope with that. So looking at dividing people up into the categories like overseas local telecommuter being somebody who works out of effectively a branch or a virtual branch in different countries. Um, then there's expats, then there's foreign hires, then there's people who just want to go and stay somewhere else for a while. So um, including a category stealth, self-directed international mm. traveler telecommuter, which basically means someone who grabs their laptop and sneaks off somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> And for personal reasons, the telecommuter slipped off overseas and started working from a foreign country unbeknownst to oh. the employer. So I think that's that's the most risky yeah. area. Um, and, yeah, I know people who've done this and who have either been caught out by their employer or who, or who have, to whatever extent, gotten away with it. But you think, well, you know, at the end of the day, what happens What if you needed medical attention? Um, you know, what if you had a massive technical problem? There are all sorts of things that could suddenly expose you. Mm -hmm in that situation and you're a long way from home and you probably have broken your own employment contract. So there's an awful lot that needs to be considered on both sides. And they've got this taxonomy of five different categories of 
COVID nomads that are describing them, but obviously we're, we're coming into this hopefully post-COVID era where people have a bit more flexibility to, to move around. And this is basically advice for employers about the risk assessment that you need to do in order to put in place some kind of policies. Um, there are all sorts of interesting things that come up, like we touched briefly on the idea that there are definitely countries that are companies that are paying different amounts for different mm -hmm. locations. So what if you've got someone on a New York salary who decides that they're going to sneak off to New Delhi instead for six months because they can stay with family there. But the, the corporation also employs people in India on a very different pay scale. So where does that leave mm. the employer? You know, should they be able to take that salary there? What if they don't tell anyone uh, they might be enjoying that? that arbitrage of salary and live extremely well, but it's incredibly unfair. And that's actually putting the employer in a, a breach situation where they're discriminating against categories Oof. of employees. So incredibly messy. Um, we haven't seen half the test cases yet that we're going to get. So this is it's a really interesting paper. We're definitely linked to it. And I think it just raises all these what if and oh my goodness, we haven't thought of that type questions. And it's going to just start the conversation that will be ongoing for a long time. I hadn't thought of that, of course. If, if it is a global corporation and you have someone uh, mm. yeah, and the salaries are different because that's the way traditionally yeah. it's been. Um, Absolutely. And the whole digital nomad thing has been like, yes, get paid to work rest, Western rates and then go and live in a co-op in Bali yeah. or something. Um, and maybe as a freelancer, you get away with that. But as an employee, it's completely different. Mm. Um, and, and whereas I said before that we are not giving uh, advice, there is one thing that I do want to say is that if, uh, listener, <laughs> if you are the person that just leaves uh, and goes and lives somewhere without telling your employees, please don't do that. It, does not, it doesn't do very good things for the advocacy of the space. <laughs> it really doesn't. It really doesn't. And to be honest, there are going to be so many stories coming out, I think, because there's unfolds because it's it, all the things that got looked the other way during lockdown okay where you've gone over your visa or whatever none of that tolerance is going to apply as travel rules relax so and yeah just get get yourself back to and you know how it works and... it just takes <laughs> yeah. a company to have one of these cases for them to say that's it everyone back to the office yeah. so please Absolutely. people <laughs> and it will blow it for everybody else so yeah just go back to where you're supposed to be have the conversation <laughs> Get a document <laughs> that works for everybody that protects all parties and then hopefully you'll be able to take to the road again safely and protected and legally employed and everything else. Yeah. Um, so, yes, thank you for, for the for the summary, uh, <laughs> Maya. And I have to say that for, for me, the one legal consideration that's always been a thing has been insurance, um, mm. which is always on my mind. But according to the paper, actually, that's the least of the problems, it sounds like, like tax and, and the legal rights of employee. I hadn't thought of that. So if your nomad goes to, to Europe, then they're covered by European law, European employment law, for mm. example, and the same, you know, the other way around. Uh, fascinating. Yeah, it's messy and complicated. And again, it just proves the fact that regulation and law has grown up in different parts of the world completely separately and while bits of it are starting to converge, it's really slow. I mean, you know, let's face it, the world's lawyers cannot even tax big corporations like Amazon and Google consistently yet, which lets them have all these loopholes. So it's going to take them a long time to get anything really consistent in place to safely employ completely nomadic people. Um, in the meantime, there'll be lots of people trying to game that system and there will be people being caught out and there will be interesting test cases coming up all over the world. So please don't be one of them. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, it is a very long uh, document, so I'll, I'll, I'll pull out something that might be um, save some people some reading time. So I think that, that for now, the most relevant is, um, I, I pull this stuff out, true short-term international telecommuting. Um, is easy to structure because legally it is the same as just an extended overseas working vacation trip, albeit one mm. with more work and less yeah. vacation. This goes back to the Ocado article. Yes, absolutely. You have a, a normal place of work and you just go yeah. on a trip somewhere. That's fine. And then yeah. um, <laughs> where self-directed international telecommuting is certain to last at most only a short period of a few weeks or a couple of months, then the employer can simply treat the arrangement as an extended overseas work trip, authorize the short-term mm. overseas travel and move on. Um, 
and then I found this interesting. So country hopping telecommuters. So the 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 version, you know, the, the idea of digital nomads that I've always had in my head. Uh, country hopping telecommuters present little legal challenge when they touch down only briefly in each your jurisdiction. So it's it sounds like what's very important is how long you are away for. Yes. And again, it depends on the country and on your status there. Um, you know, you, Pilar, having a European passport, you could come and spend 180 days in Spain before you become tax resident. Somebody else coming from the UK, your next door neighbor, will get into trouble on day 91. Mm. Because, you know, so yeah. everything is so complicated and individual. Exactly. That's the thing. That's the thing. So this is very good news, Maya, for <laughs> some of our friends. <laughs> Oh, uh, the lawyers are going to get rich off this one. Um, and good luck to them because we, you know, we need clarity on this. So please, um, yeah. Sort well, out I wasn't thinking of the lawyers who are going to go kashing, <laughs> but I was thinking of companies that make all this kind of stuff just a little bit easier when it starts to get complicated. Oh, yes. um, of course, yeah. we're not talking then of digital nomads, but I can see how people might have to decide that they want to employ a person in another country and that's going to be the easiest way of moving forward. Uh, so that's why um, remote.com, so we had uh, Nadia Vatalidis uh, here a couple of episodes ago, just got loads of VC funding uh, and I asked mm. Nadia if there was anything she wanted to share with listeners and she was very keen to share a video where they explain how they're going to use the money. So they really want to just be able to branch out a lot more. So that's that's worth looking uh, looking for, um, looking at. And also just on remote.com news, um, Marcus Vermouth, who was with Buffer and who regular listeners will have heard on this show many times, he's now working for remote.com. <laughs> so <laughs> small yeah. world people. Um, yeah, but it should, it's going to be a huge growth, this kind of the organizations that make it easy for people to just transfer from one country to another and do all the local compliance, um, that's going to be a huge industry too. So yes, we wish them good luck as well. The lawyers don't need our luck. <laughs> yeah, they, they know, they know, it. They all, they're always at right work. Anyway, but, um, <laughs> yeah. And also another bit of uh, of news is that Shield GEO, who of course we had a seven-part collaboration in 2020 uh, during our season, special season on connection and disconnection in remote teams. It's been acquired by Velocity Global. Again, just the proof that that kind of business and in particular Shield uh, are going to just have, um, there's going to be a lot more need for them. So um, yeah. congratulations to everyone. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, it just proves that, you know, corporations don't want to open branches in hundreds of different countries. If they can just tap into these services that make all that go away, then they can do this very cleanly and easily and at the same time make sure their people are safely and legally employed and they know where they are. So it sounds like a win-win yeah, all around. And it gives uh, entrepreneurs and smaller businesses the opportunity to do that and, and to do it in a sustainable long-term way without having to. Mm. So that's great. Um, okay, so we can maybe... Oh, sorry, before before we before we move on, Maya, anything else we need to touch upon on this whole... Um, expansion and extension of of uh, people wanting to work from a different country to where they've been working? No, only that this is going to be something to mm. watch. And it's something I'm personally really interested in and writing and researching more about. And I'm talking to the Estonians about it too, um, who have the e-residency framework for entrepreneurs. And they're interested in different models for this kind of transnational citizenship and location. And I, I think it's going to be something we're going to see lots of different models emerging from even from the country level over coming years and how corporations adapt to that. And then individuals, it's I'm really looking forward to telling the stories of what's going on in that space because it's going to keep changing and transforming. Good. So I will translate that to a call to action uh, for listeners, which is <laughs> if you have any stories, any thoughts, or you come across any articles that you want to send us, and in particular to Maya, do so. Yes, Use please. the contact form <laughs> at virtualnotdistant.com because that means we can both see what's coming through there. Um, but also, I know that we have lots of listeners who run their own companies here on this show. So if you want Maya to write an article for you, she's got her own company and she can do that. Um, so do, do, do get in touch with her um, because, uh, as you've heard, she 
she really wants to 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 be doing this. So if you have any writing work for her, <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> feel free, and I'll take a commission later. Okay, right. So. <laughs> Great. So, uh, virtualnotdistant.com for all your comments. Now, what is interesting about this, Maya, is that while we're focusing so much on location, and the focus is completely on location at the moment, with the thing about hybrid workplace, it's all about is it the office or is it the home? Is it the office? Mm. <laughs> is it the home? Um, and actually, uh, Slack um, is part of uh, futureforum.com, and they are doing lots of research lately. And they brought up in uh, mid-June some research which said that actually flexible working hours are more important than flexible locations as uh, for, for mm. the employees they surveyed. So, yeah. yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Just this whole idea of just remember the big yes. picture flexibility as a principle if you can get that established first then actually things like location and hours and the tools you use or how you message each other and things like that they're all details um if you have that trust and that results focus that you can work flexibly everything else can stem from that yeah and then it can go back to um some of the issues we were talking about earlier which is if you have a workforce that is very diverse in what they do and how they do it and not everyone can have flexibility in location if flexibility is the mindset rather than where are people working mm. from then you can then tackle that and also people hear that yes. also they hear this is about flexibility you you cannot have the flexibility in that but we can f- help you find where else you can have flexibility um absolutely yeah i think that's so important like even you know if i were a van driver and i read that news release from Ocado, think okay well probably i can't go and work for them in another country but it it says loud and clearly that they consider the individual preference and that people want to take flexibility and, and choose how and where they want to work, it would make me more likely to want to work for them than somewhere else that hadn't expressed that publicly. Well, hopefully it'll make you start thinking, okay, I would like some of that flexibility. What in my work mm. can be changed? Yeah, what do I yeah, want? Yeah. What, you know, locations, yeah. shifts, exactly. hours, what colour my values? Yeah. Well, you know, what's important yeah. to me in terms of flexibility? That, that's really, or, or what can I put inside my van? You know, really, this yeah. this is um, some of these things we might not have thought about their importance before. But flexibility in anything is going to make a huge difference. So, yeah, yeah nice one. Um, and then, so talking about Slack, uh, you found, uh, you shared a screenshot <laughs> from from Slack. What yeah. was it? Oh, it was a bit, a bit of a silly one, really, but it was um, an app update from Slack, and I'm, I'll, I'll put it in in the show notes just so everyone can see. But I think Slack are quite famous actually for their UX writing, and they've got a lovely reputation for being great at how they communicate with with their teams. And um, they basically had a software update, but nothing to say about it, so they just put this cute little message in the in the app update, which is all, "Hope you're all okay." Um, <laughs> <laughs> hope everybody's well and looking after yourselves um uh yeah it was just quite sweet really are you drinking enough water or eating some vegetables because <laughs> they had nothing important to say about the update but a slack love us and yes of course it's all marketing but it made me smile so i hope it will make you smile and too. it's a good reminder and you really can't remind people enough to get enough sleep you really can't right you really <laughs> yeah well you really can't i mean hopefully they'll improve um maybe they should be reminding people to master their slack notifications yes. so that you get enough sleep <laughs> a bit binging at you in the middle of the night but yes. we know that they're building all that yeah. stuff in so it's a useful reminder of the big picture why we yeah, do this it's really good um and the other update that might be worth mentioning is that they now have huddles, they've called them, which are audio spaces. So regular right. listeners and anyone who is really in the in the social media world will know that Clubhouse started the conversation about uh, um, spontaneous audio and the Twitter spaces. And then someone heard that, I think it was, who was it? Was it Matt, Matt Mullenberg that was in a clubhouse and the guy from Slack was there and Matt said, oh, the one thing I miss in Slack are like these audio only places. And they said, oh, they're yeah, coming. They said, oh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so they're here now. Yeah. Um, I, but I mean, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It shows how fast things yeah. move because um, has anyone mentioned clubhouse for the last couple of mm, months? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Since I turned my notifications off, I've forgotten yeah. all about it. So maybe what we need is these more curated experiences, which we've already got in our Slack communities. Um, and to have audio there, it'd be interesting to see what that adds to the experience. Oh, that's interesting because I was thinking 
because I was th- I I never think of Slack as the place for communities, even though it's highly used and 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 of course I'm part of them. But I was thinking in work, what's the difference between opening an audio meeting in Slack mm. uh, and the huddles? So I think it's um, I think it's interesting as well that that yeah. Uh, I was just hopefully we'll see some differentiation and practice emerge about how people mm. use it and you know doing different things with it and then we'll get some people to come and talk to us about how they're using it in their organizations because the more functionality they add the more choice they have and it'll just be good to see how people make use of that yeah it'll be great it'll be great to hear how that uh, oh, any Slack, any Slackers out there, any Slack users, um, let us know if this is something that uh, you've started to use that you've been using for a while, actually, um, because mm. at the beginning, everyone uses everything. And then it's you, you yes, only see yeah. if it's really useful or how it's been used after a couple of months have gone by and what sticks. So listen, especially if you've been playing with these huddles in Slack for a while, or if you're listening to quite in the future, I'm sure Microsoft Teams will have something similar if they haven't announced it yet. Um, So (laughs) any collaboration (laughs) platform, how are you using the fact that you can very quickly jump on an audio call in your team? Uh, Are you using that? How are you using it? Virtualnotdistant.com. I think that's the end of our articles, Maya. Uh, I... We've covered yes, a lot, we, we have, and and all around the same topic, which is nice and satisfying. Um, I I only have we d- we don't have any community news today, but I just want to say that I've changed my co working space. Uh, well, I've changed. Mm, yes, I saw your new. Yes, address. so virtual not Sorry. distant has a new registered address, uh, and it's interesting because so I've been using a local space which I haven't been using a lot, which is why I'm leaving. And I'm now signing up for a space in Leicester Square, which is the middle of town in London. And a friend of mine said, why are you doing a commute? (laughs) So it it kind of started me thinking around this whole thing about the word commute. What is a commute? Um, and, And I was thinking, well, I'm choosing to go into town and I am getting that space because it gives me an incentive to go into town because what's happened is that I live in zone two of London so and it's a lovely neighborhood I don't need to leave there to do stuff really mm-hmm. I have everything and I'm not using Soho which I love uh, and of course there's been the whole yeah. problem of having to get the tube to get there but and I'm thinking I really want to start using it and there's this space which is very cheap it's called the Pop Hub Leicester Square and um, incredibly cheap and I thought, well, if I go in, at least I can then use a little bit of Soho. I can maybe, once things start to open up a bit more, I can have coffee there with people and stuff like that. So I'm actually using that to get me not just out of the yeah. house, but into a different environment that actually I am missing. Um, yeah. So this is your little local nomad. <laughs> local nomadism. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I w- going into zone but, one. <laughs> but I think psychologically, like I would never think of it as a commute because it's not every day. No. It's when I choose to. So again, it's choice, mindset. and you can do it at any time of day as well. And you can the just, flexibility. Yeah, taking coffee and shopping. Yeah, and the flexibility of vibe, it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. so that's so that's that's the only news I have, Maya. <laughs> well, I think that that's great news. Um, I've got this lovely new co-working down the road from me, which I've sort of signed <gasps> up with. Um, so I'll be helping them with some oh. stuff anyway. Um, but I get, I think for me, it's more kind of knowing it's there. I've hardly yeah. been there. <laughs> I was there when some people were working on our roof because I thought, you know, people were going to be like banging on the ceiling. I really can't cope yeah. with that. Um, and they've got really powerful aircon as well, which is quite nice in Spain at yes. the moment. But because Spain, they have now closed down for two weeks in August, so <laughs> that's the hottest part of the year. I'm reliant on my own aircon. Ah, uh, uh, the the the, the um, co-working space has closed down, not the whole of Valencia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you... No, no, they just uh, they just opened and then they've closed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> okay, fine. But I can really see it picking up um, in September. Um, we're hoping to get some local events and things going there, and some international business networking. So it's all part of this world unlocking a bit, mm. I think, and starting to consider the possibilities that even those of us who work from home habitually have also been subject to lockdown and restriction and lack of choice. And maybe we're just choosing to mix things up a little bit, whether that's Pilar going to Soho or me going down the road just for a change of scene. Excellent. So that is great that you, that well, that we took the conversation to the co-working space. Listeners, if you are new and are interested in co-working, how it can help you either as an individual or if you are in charge of an organisation, 
why you should seriously be considering access to co-working spaces for your remote workers, check out episode 279, which is the episode, uh, mm. two episodes before this one, co-working spaces, the missing piece in the hybrid conversation. And listeners, that is the end of this episode, unless Maya has anything to add. No, just wishing everybody a happy summer. Hope you're managing to get some kind of break, holiday, vacation time <laughs> somewhere, somehow. The changes. <laughs> Good. So I'll rattle off the calls to action. Remember to subscribe to the show, 21st Century Work Life, in whatever podcast app you are using. And if you're listening to us on a website, go and get an app. <laughs> Spotify will do. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm not supposed to mention any, um, any, any places or else we get in trouble with some of the places. Find your favorite app. Uh, you can sign up to our monthly newsletter letter which has reading and listening recommendations plus a digest of our own content and that you can do that over at virtualnotdistant.com and remember that we have a download guide on leading through visible teamwork you can follow our page on LinkedIn you can follow our Twitter virtual teamwork with a zero instead of an O virtualnotdistant.com has a contact form we'd love to hear from you and if you prefer good old fashioned email then you can email me directly pilar at virtualnotdistant.com thank you for listening A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Orti, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.